But you know what? When I first heard this case, Stu, this was the case I was listening to on My Favorite Murder when I was driving to Kentucky and I had that crazy night where I almost went <gasps> off the cliff. Oh my God. I was, so imagine, okay, after this, I'll, I'll like go back and be like, how do you feel about everything? Like after the yeah. whole case, but like imagine hearing this case of like a wooded encampment, the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders, and then you end up in a situation where you have to crawl out of your car and you're stranded in the dark of the woods. I, I experienced a level of paranoia out there that I don't think I've ever experienced in my life. I really thought I was seeing things actually. And I was dead serious. And I made us get back into the car, which is the craziest part because I had convinced myself in like, I don't know, the fright of, of going off the cliff, but also being stranded outside of the car and in the middle of nowhere and no cell reception. I convinced myself that I saw someone in the woods. That's and what I was, terrifies me. And I was dead serious. I was, I, there was nothing in my mind, no shadow of a doubt where I was like, that's not a person or I'm seeing things or my eyes are playing tricks on me. Cause it's like two in the morning at this point. Yeah. I was like, there's someone in these woods. I was losing my mind. I was losing my mind in Kentucky. That was when you were with your sister, right? Was with my sister, and I was, I think I told this on the very first podcast episode, but we yeah. were going up to an Airbnb in the mountains of Kentucky, and we had gone off the trail somehow in the dark, and the car almost flipped off the ledge of the mountain. Like, it was literally, the back wheels were hanging off kind I of thing. I can't, I can't. Oh my gosh. And, I, oh god, I'll, ooh, that's still, I think that's the scariest moment of my life <laughs> i can't think of anything else scarier i know <laughs> but yeah i mean having heard this podcast before that definitely made it exponentially worse um and i vowed to never go back to kentucky but you know specifically the mountains of kentucky <laughs> right i have a i have an old quote i was looking at quotes from when we were on tour and there was one about kentucky and it was like nothing good ever happens in kentucky <laughs> <laughs> Where I think it was we? from Cheyenne. <laughs> we were that in Bowling Green, sense. right? It was like Bowling Green, Kentucky. Oh yeah, Bowling Creek. That was our very first show. Yeah, and we also went to a cave. If you remember, oh, did you I come didn't with us? Go. I didn't go. I, I didn't feel well. I no. Oh no. So I stayed. Well, we, back we were drinking the night before. I think La Quinta or wherever we were. <laughs> oh, we weren't in La Quinta. Honey. We were oh, in yeah, like we a, a quality in a sleep yeah, in days in. <laughs> If we were lucky. At yeah. <laughs> the amount of times that we would just go to like days in and be like, who's hitting the pool? And we just go to that <laughs> semen infested pool with you like one more. dead. There's like a dead body in like a beach chair. <laughs> like, <laughs> By the end of it, we were just unfazed. Like there could be someone literally floating in the pool and we were like, nope, all right, that's all right. We'll get in. Well, look, look, I thought I had been in the worst of the worst hotels on tour. I doing the road trip with my sister back to Connecticut last summer. Um, we stayed. She was like, I want a cheap, cheap, cheap motel. And I'm like, I'm going to teach you a lesson and I'm going to book us a cheap <laughs> motel so you can see like what that actually is. Because in yeah. her mind, it's like, oh, my God, it'll just be like a Best Western or something. So I book us in a Super 8 in Hell. Oh, this was this was sorry. This was Connecticut back to California. So I think we had booked it in West Virginia, a Super Eight West Virginia. God, <laughs> I just sent a Hold shiver on. down my spine. <laughs> Let me take a sip of this. Hold on. <laughs> so we get into this Super Eight. Immediately smells of decomposition. It's it's pretty. It feels it feels as if there's a dead body in there for sure. Um, only I think maybe two out of the six lights in the room work. Which is fine. Um, but that's not really the worst part of it. You know, we're kind of sleeping. We went out to dinner. We did all this stuff. We come back. And we go. I go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I get up. Turn on the light. I see about 15 roaches just scatter into various directions. And I was like, oh, Mel, wake up. <laughs> come look. <laughs> it's like a roach infested, dead body ass motel super oh. 8. And we... I realized this later. We're the only people there. We were the only room booked for the night. God bless you. God did not bless me at that moment. Yeah. God, he, he smited me. <laughs> I don't know if I have ever stayed in a Super 8. I have stayed in a Red Roof Inn, and that was harrowing. Harrowing. I remember actually, like, <sighs> never have, having felt so just gross in my life. 
Was it on tour? No. Oh, okay. I, I thought, did we stay in a Red Roof? I feel like we stayed in one. I don't think we did. I, we stayed in an Econo Lodge. Yes, we did. <laughs> With <laughs> the woman who sent the maid and pulled a gun on her. I, that was the Econo Lodge. That was the Econo Lodge. And then we stayed at one more Econo Lodge, which was just as bad towards the end. But we were like, we don't care. like, Because the maid pulling the gun was at the very beginning of tour when we all still thought that, like, we, you know. There was, oh, I remember it was Denver. It was, it was, def- it was Denver. definitely Denver. Yeah. Um, But I remember... I knew the Econo Lodge was going to be bad because Betty, I think, had was with us at that point, and she said, "I think I might sleep in the van tonight." <laughs> and I, I, we were like, "What?" And she was like, "Yeah, I've been down this road before." And we were like, "Okay." Would would sleeping in a car in the cold of Colorado be the better alternative to sleeping in the Econo Lodge? I forgot. Oh. Oh God. R.I.P. R.I.P. To us and and whatever that era was, I don't I don't know what era I could call our tour era. I, I don't know if it was a flop era, if it was a reformative era. I think it was a reformative era. Era, yeah. but it started it started as a flop era for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like the yeah. fact that I can now stay in a like Hilton is that's just a feather in my cap. <laughs> mm. Well. To get into it, to credit first and foremost, who suggested this case? This is Shri the B5, otherwise known as, wait, what did I just say? Shreemuth Parachurla. Thank you for suggesting the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders and sending me into a spiral. <laughs> Hi, Shreemuth. Shri, is, it, is that what we said? Yes. Shri, Shri the B. Shri, Shri the, B5. the B. I love it. I love Sheree the Bee. Um, thank you for suggesting this. And welcome, everybody, to Creep Time, the podcast with your hosts, Silas Dean and Stu. Hi. 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 How are you? <laughs> I'm back on Jeffree you? Star um, <laughs> TikTok, and I need to cut that <laughs> out. But like, Oh, my gosh. He, he makes a good so point. Obsessed. I know. He makes a good point on TikTok where he's like, I review makeup. And he was like, and here's the thing. He's like, I am the only person who reviews makeup who has enough money to review it honestly. And I'm like, that's really true, to be honest. I feel like that's kind of true because he has this insane net worth of like $200, $300 million. Like he doesn't have to be bought by any brand deals. He's his own line. So like when he reviews makeup from other brands, I generally feel like it's honest unless he's just trying to like, he knows like internally because he's a CEO of his company that that's like a close competitor to his brand. So Mm -hmm. he's sort of strategically like fueling the fire of like, this is trash. I would assume, like, who would be close to Jeffree Star in terms of makeup? Because his whole thing is vibrancy, I think. Like, really pigmented, yeah, like, vibrant colors. Well, unfortunately, his his old enemy, or his enemy, I guess, currently still, Kat Von D. Kat, Kat Von D? Oh, I yeah. guess so. Does she still, she still makes makeup? She still oh, yeah, makes she makeup, must. but it's kind of gotten really, I mean, from what, it used to be really good, like, probably 10 years ago. And I feel like now mm-hmm. nobody cares about it. I don't know. I mean, a lot of makeup has changed, too. I mean, like, what was popular, I think, and probably, like, a matte look has totally changed to dewy. Like, makeup mm-hmm. just has a different, like, ebb and flow, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, unless you modify and keep with the times, like, I don't know. I don't know. I've been hearing, about, like, House Labs is really big right now in Sephora. Um, they're know. literally everywhere. Like, I went into Sephora because I go there for skincare and, like, colognes and stuff. But um, occasionally I'll get makeup there. I like the Sephora collection for foundations. But... Mm-hmm. House Labs is pretty pricey. They're up there at like 30, 40 bucks. It looks really good. It does look really good. I I think it's, it's probably a decent formula. Um, Couldn't beat my elf, my elf (laughs) makeup. (laughs) Can I turn everybody (laughs) onto something? (laughs) (laughs) How do we tie this into murder? Um, I know. I was like, somehow I'm going to pivot this back to one of the most (laughs) gruesome. I'm giving myself like a release before this, but it is, such a tough case, the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders that like, I, I don't know, I I find like a natural tendency of myself where I'm like avoiding talking about it and going back into it. But it's important that I do. And I feel like it's important because I've now researched this case a lot. And out of all of the research that I've looked at, I've listened to podcasts, I've watched videos, I've read articles, barely anybody talks about the girls who were affected outside of like their names, 
and their ages. The entire case is like centralized around like, I, I don't know, creating some, some kind of like weird, like fright around the Girl Scouts, but also like playing into the fear of like camping and like the actual person who was behind it. They don't talk about the backstories of the girls. So I didn't like an extra bit of research of everything I could find on these girls because I didn't really know who they were outside of the pictures that I've seen. Have you heard of the story? Okay. The one component of this that I know, I think, and I'm praying to God it's not true. They're like little girls, right? They're little girls. Yeah. Okay. I have heard of this case and Mm -hmm. I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong, that Kristen Chenoweth yeah documentary yeah. or they're gonna that's do pretty recent something. too that's pretty okay. new um i think it just came out but Kristen chenoweth i don't know the full story um but i did have some friends who watched that and like reported back to me on it she was supposed to go on this girl scout trip yes i don't know if the story extends to the point where she was supposed to be in the tent with these girls but what i will say um which is odd is that the tent they were in they were the only tent that was sleeping three girls. Most of the tents slept four. So they were mm-hmm. down a girl. I don't know if that was Kristen Chenoweth. I really do not know what her involvement was aside from like, she's from Oklahoma and she was supposed to go on this encampment trip, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's a brutal story. And I learned a lot about the Girl Scouts through researching it. But do you know anything outside of the Kristen Chenoweth connection or just that it was little girls? Like I, what happened? That's all I know. Okay. Okay. I mean, it, it is quite heavy. So I, I definitely will preface before we get into it that it's it's a pretty gruesome story. It is uh, very senseless, very sad, as all true crime cases are. But this one, this one hits especially hard for some reason. Um, but the story, it really ties back to this camp, though, Stu. It's, um, it's a camp called Camp Scott, which was this popular location, um, not only for, you know, Girl Scout uh, tourism, but also it's right outside of Locust Grove, Oklahoma, which is like two miles away. And that was a a small town that was like heavily dependent on tourism, whether it was tourism from like the seasonal um, camps that would go on through the Girl Scouts, or it was people who were coming to like use the lake or use other campsites. I don't know, see the sites. Um, So this, you know, hit them just as hard in terms of like how much this really took down a full community like how bad this was. Um, And I also didn't realize, like while I was researching this, just how long the Girl Scouts had been around. Do you know? Mm, They're old. Yes, I would say like 1925. I mean, you're you're somewhat close. It's 1912, actually. It goes back to specifically for the Girl Scouts. I think the Boy Scouts might even be older. I'm assuming they're older. Um before we get into it, I should tell my horrific Girl Scout story. I was going into buy Girl Scout, or I wasn't going into buy Girl Scout cooking cookies. I was going into a Home Goods. Can I tell you this? No. And there were Girl Scouts who were like, they were pitched outside of the Home Goods, and they were selling Girl Scout cookies. And they were like, do you want to buy some cookies? And I was like, oh, thank you so much, but no, I'm on a diet. And she looked me up and down, and she goes, oh, that's good. <laughs> I the kid, or the, the the kid the child, the nine year old child in uniform. She goes, Oh, that's good. You're like, and All I, right, all right, bitch, give me five boxes oh, of Samoas. <laughs> I walked into the home goods, I cried for a bit, I came out, I bought <laughs> thin mints. Like, <laughs> my god, she was like, If I'm not gonna get the sale, I'm gonna shame you. Oh, I'm gonna shame my you. gosh, that was so but funny. What, What I didn't know was that girls sell Girl Scout cookies and it's incentivized by um, the prize is that you get to go to camp. I didn't know that. I. uh, It may have changed. It may have changed now, but back in the 70s, that was that was a way you could get like a free um, pass to go to camp. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they they probably still have some version of that, especially for, you know, kids who are Girl Scouts who maybe don't come from the means to go to camp, like maybe that's the way in like if you can like earn your ticket into camp by selling mm-hmm. enough girl scout cookies because that's what happened to one of these girls so yes we have the girl scouts um this is an overnight excursion which is um pretty common i would say i think the girl scouts has a lot of familial tradition for a lot of people and people generally feel safe about sending their kids there they feel good about them participating but these families like never could have imagined like what was going to happen at this camp in Oklahoma. 
So Camp Scott, like I said, it's about two miles south of Locust Grove, Oklahoma. It's a very rural area, this place. There's really not a lot that's around. Um, It's really just this spot and then like local spots and like food spots and lakes. But the story centralizes around three girls. They would include Lori Lee Farmer, who was only eight years old, Doris Denise Milner, uh, who went by Denise and she was 10, and Michelle Heather Gousset, who was nine. Um, I've heard a couple of people refer to her last name as Goose, uh, but I believe it's pronounced Gousset. Uh, and I, like I said, I don't see a lot of other podcasts or reports on this that dive into the girls and dive into who they were. So I want to give you a little bit of backstory before I get into the actual story and just tell you who they were, where they came from. And what's insane is that they all have final letters. Did you know about this? What? So like the, um, the Girl Scouts, like it basically what happened when they got there, the, the whole camp was kind of shut down because it started storming. So they kept the girls in their tents and they were like, just write a letter home on the first night to be like the first day of camp. So all three of these girls wrote letters home that would never make it home. Oh and it is the last letter they would all write just <sighs> hours before they were killed. Mm. It's bone chilling but i wanted to read them at least to give you like a perspective and a bit of like a a, a pov of their voice who they were yeah. who their families were um just because no one's i'd never heard of that no one's ever talked about it in this case so i'm gonna start with doris denise milner who i said goes by denise she was the oldest of the girls 10 years old and she was from tulsa oklahoma so her mother actually later said that she really wasn't very excited to go to camp. She was very on the fence about it because she was one of these girls who had sold cookies to get to camp and she had never been. Um, So she was very, very nervous, very anxious about it, but she was an exceptional girl. I mean, straight A student. She'd just been accepted into a pretty prestigious magnet school um, for middle school, uh, which she was going to attend in the fall. And she was really excited about it. Um, But she's uh, scheduled to attend this camp with the girls. So, she just really wants to stay home with her five-year-old sister and her mother, but her mom actually convinced her. And she was like, no, I think this would be good for you. Like you'll gain a little bit of independence. You'll go out. And if you decide you don't like it after day one or two, you can always call home and I'm going to come down. I'm going to get you. Right. So I have her final letter that she wrote that night in the tent to her mom. So she, it reads, uh, dear mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day it rained. I have three new friends, Glenda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. Mm. Which is like, they really don't teach kids to write letters like that anymore. Mm-mm. I feel like we learned a little bit of like, I, I don't know, maybe maybe a little bit of like uh, writing letters, structuring letters in like elementary school, but... I don't know, to sign a letter like your loving child, Denise, just, yeah. it just seems so sweet. Mm-hmm. Like, what a well-mannered like kid. So formal, yeah. But it's it's chilling to read these and to know that like what was to come just later in the night is just so, so harrowing. But she references two people in that letter. She says Lori and Michelle, who were the other two girls. So there's Michelle Heather Gousset, who was nine. And she was from a town called Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And she was a bright and athletic girl and totally different. Like, she was really excited to go to camp, actually. I think she had been the year before. So she already knew, like, what the deal was. She had friends that were probably coming back. So what she was mostly concerned about before leaving was that her parents were going to take care of her plants. Because she had plants at home. So, I know. It's, like... Reading these in the context, I, I read all of this after I knew the story, and it was this is why I was in a bad place yesterday, Stu. Yeah. Oh my god. Heavy as hell. But um, her father later recalled this uh, sort of eerie departure with her, which he dropped her off um, for camp and said that the goodbye was almost like she was saying goodbye forever, which was strange. Like he he really like later thought about this and he made a statement saying like, it almost felt like an odd premonition. Like, like she, she was saying he couldn't understand like why she was saying goodbye in such a definitive way. It was very off putting to the parents. Mm -hmm. Um, So they say goodbye. They have full faith in her. She's going to be fine. She's done this before she did it last year. She also wrote a letter home, but she wrote it to her aunt. So her letter reads, dear aunt Karen, 
How are you? I'm fine. I'm writing from camp. We can't go outside because it's storming. Me and my tent mates are in the last tent in our unit. My tent mates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmer. My room is in shades of purple. Love, Michelle. Uh, and then we would have Lori, who was the last girl, and she is the youngest of the girls. And she was eight years old, and she was actually the youngest girl of all of the girls on this retreat. I think there were like 120 of them there or something. So, Lori, she was also from Tol- uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, just like Denise. And she was also apprehensive about going because she hadn't been. She's eight years old. Um But her mother also wanted to push her because she thought it would be a good thing for her based on, you know, being in the scouts already and selling the cookies. So her mother actually chose the exact campsite and the exact week she would go. And she's talked about this in interviews, too, and like the immense uh, sort of guilt that she's felt over that, even though it was nothing she could have foreseen completely out of her control. And it was a horrible, horrible thing to happen. But Lori writes a letter that night as well um, that reads as follows. Dear mom, dad, Misty and Joe and Chad and Kathy. And I think those are her sisters and her one brother. We're getting ready for bed. It's 745. We're at the beginning of a storm and having a lot of fun. I've met two friends, Michelle Gousset and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. It started raining on the way back from dinner and we're sleeping on cots. I couldn't wait to write. We're all writing letters now because there's hardly anything else to do. With love, Lori. And Mm. on the first night of that retreat, all three of these girls would, of course, enter Camp Scott and they would never make it home. So before I get into what exactly happened, had you ever heard anything close to the backstories of those girls? Why has that been omitted from any of the, the press coverage on this and the storytelling? I know, especially the storytelling element. Um, It gives you such uh, immediate context into what their little personalities were probably like, which makes it just that much more upsetting and disturbing. But I can already start to picture like who they kind of are just based off of their, their writing style and their their ages. Totally. Yeah. It also, it reminds me because I think it's, uh, shockingly like easy to forget sometimes with this case because so much of it is focused on the actual perpetrator to remember that these were girls they were children but when mm-hmm. i hear hear this in their voice i'm reminded of just how young they are and how impressionable and scared and it's you know in a in a foreign place where like you know they don't really know they've never been camping or they've never been with the girl scouts camping they're with new people like so many elements here that uh, compromised safety and we'll get into a little bit later about how the girl scouts actually handled this and how Mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot that goes on there as well but i should run you through what actually happened so on june 12th of 1977 this was a sunday morning and it would mark another round of girl scouts coming through on buses for the overnight excursion on these grounds so i guess like seasonally They just basically do trips, um, like Girl Scout retreats, in like two-week increments. So this was going to be the June trip uh, for, I think, the latter or the the middle part of June. So the way that it worked was that rather than like families actually bringing them to like Locust Grove or to Camp Scott, they would kind of come to like a shuttle bus location. Uh, So a lot of the shuttle buses were leaving from Tulsa, and they would get on these buses that were organized by the Girl Scouts, and the buses would take them into Camp Scott. So throughout the day, the buses are kind of piling into the camp and, you know, it's like the normal stuff. It's organization. It's really exciting. They're getting tent assignments. They're getting grouped together. Um, But it's around 7 p.m. on the first night that that thunderstorm that they mentioned rolls in. So they had just finished dinner and it is starting to downpour over this camp and it would remain raining almost the entire night. So that meant that the girls couldn't do any of the first night activities. They couldn't do any of the bonding stuff around the campfire they were just instructed to go back to their tents and kind of lights out by 7.45, 8 p.m., right? So that's when they tell them, they're like, you know, write letters home, like just something to occupy the time. You can play card games. It, it would still probably be fun. Or did you ever do a camping trip like that when you were younger? Um, We did, definitely not when I was like eight or 10, but our school, 
school besides not the one that we had to do as seniors, but we right. did um, little away camps. I went to a place called Camp Canuga, Camp Cheerio. We had to do similar kind of like little kid camp. Mm-hmm. So I'm familiar. It's wild to think that like kids now going camping, they but they probably take their phones with them, I'm assuming. It's probably a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah, because I did, I did um, Nature's Classroom, which was a week-long excursion camping when I was 10. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, like, I, that's immediately what I thought of as I was reading this. Like, I, I could remember, like, we were bussed in and all of the organization, the tent assignments, counselors break you off. And, like, the first night is really, like, campfire activities and, like, night hikes. Yeah. And I don't know, it was such a good time. But that that's what I was envisioning while reading through this story. So, like I said, it's lights out around 7.45, 8 p.m. Uh, but then, that very same night, this is around 1.30 in the morning, one of the camp counselors, she kind of wakes up from her tent, and she hears a strange noise. So, it's still raining at this point, but she decides she's going to get up with her umbrella, and she's going to get up with her flashlight, and she's going to walk down a path, because she either had to go to the bathroom, or she, like, she also wanted to like investigate what that noise was. So, she's making her way down the path, and... When I heard the stories, dude, it gave me so, so many f-ing chills. Like, the noise is described as, like, a very guttural and kind of low moaning sound. Like a, like a whimpering, but also, like, a grunting. And she, like, wasn't sure if it was a person or if it was an animal. So she's, like, traveling towards the noise in the rain with this flashlight. And she's getting closer to it. So she, once she finally got, like, down the trail a bit, she shined the flashlight in the um in the direction and the noise stops so then she turns in another direction and the noise starts up again shines the light back the noise stops so at this point she had convinced herself this counselor she's like this is some kind of animal and i i don't want to confront it especially not like in like a storm condition so i'm just going to back up i'm going to go back to my tent but she remembered as she was falling asleep she could still hear that noise that like bizarre the grunting, that like guttural grunting coming from the woods. It's chilling. But this same counselor um, would actually make the first discovery in this case. So she goes to sleep that night. And then she wakes up the next morning by 6 a.m. And she's going to head towards the camp showers, which were closest to tent number eight, which is where these three girls were located. Um, I will say that I have researched this with like, several reputable sources and they're giving different accounts of which tent it was, whether it was tent eight or tent seven, but I don't think that the tent number is important. It's important to remember that their tent, the girl's tent was the furthest away from the counselor's tent. It was Mm. actually partially obstructed too, because it was like adjacent to or behind the camp showers. So it was kind of, it was like far out from like the group you could say. Mm -hmm. So, it's 6 a.m. She's making her way towards the showers and she's walking down the path when she stumbles upon something that's really chilling. She sees off the path on this tree, there's like a pile of sleeping bags. And she's like, what the hell? So she, she gets off the track and the path and she's, you know, walking down towards the tree when she sees a girl who's laying there sleeping, like partially out of her sleeping bag. And she's like panicking because she's like, oh my God, like, did this girl sleep out here all night? Like it was pouring all, she must be freezing. Like she's probably soaked. Like she's freaking out. So she gets down even closer when she realizes that she's not sleeping. She's a bludgeoned child. Mm -hmm. So full adrenaline sets in. She races back to the other counselors and they immediately go into panic mode and they start doing a head count to find all of the girls and make sure everyone's accounted for. And of course they find that in Kent or tent number eight, none of the girls are there. The tent is empty. It's so much like the discovery is probably the, I think the worst part of this, but what would come later, I think with the evidence is also really harrowing. So, this entire day just turns into like this chaotic and horrific array of discoveries and cover-ups. And for one, uh, this is where we'll get into a little bit of how the Girl Scouts handled this. The families were called um, in a, a very specific order. So they were called by the regional director of the Girl Scouts as to what happened. But 
the way that the calls happened, the Girl Scouts director, this was found in phone records, called their insurance company first. They then Mm. called their attorneys. They then called the parents. And even on the phone, and it's not clear whether this was the judgment of the Girl Scouts director or this came from their attorneys, on the phone, calling the parents individually, they said, your daughter has died. She, there was an accident. She died in the <gasps> night. They did no. not tell the parents. Oh my gosh. They did not tell the parents, one, that there were other girls that died that night, but they specifically told them it was an accident. They did not mention they were murdered. And the, uh, they give no specifics, no details. Parents are grief-stricken, confused, spiraling on these phones, and there, there's nothing that they're offering them. And truthfully, I mean, at this point, they really didn't know very much, but they certainly knew. They certainly knew these girls were murdered. But that's just a, like a little sliver of um, how the, the Girl Scouts actually handled this. And I believe the parents in the 80s would go on to pursue this legally, um, I don't know what the outcome was of that, but I know one of the families opted not to participate for whatever reason. Mm. So what goes on during the day? Now, when police arrived at the scene, it was really shocking for the community and and for law enforcement. All three girls were found piled up on the tree, and one was described in the original report as outside or visible outside of her sleeping bag, while the other two bodies were described as stuffed and crumpled at the bottom of one of the other sleeping bags. And this was just outside of the Kiowa encampment, I think is how it's pronounced. The immediate evidence was suggesting that the girls had been attacked in their sleep, but one of them was either led or she was dragged while still alive a ways away from their tent. Uh, But they had all been beaten, they were sexually assaulted, and their final moments were the result of being bludgeoned and strangled. As for additional evidence that was found at the scene, this included a red flashlight, which had one smudged fingerprint on it, but it was too smudged for them to ever get like a print that they could match up to somebody. And they also found only one footprint, which was near the tent. And this was of a size nine and a half men's shoe. So the, the horror of the scene um, immediately calls for an evacuation by 10 a.m. And the entire site is shut down permanently after 50 years of operation and the people of Locust Grove sort of drastically changed their perspective on the town and its safety within one day. Like businesses were closed. Um, They probably wouldn't be patroned again. Many of them would close completely. Children were no longer allowed to walk outside alone. They were no longer allowed to play outside while this was going on. It was, it was chaotic for, for this town. They had never experienced something like this. And, you know, there were some of the girls um, who, who were there who I think have gone on to, like, make statements about this later on, talking about, like, what the experience of that was like as a child and the shock and, and the sort of, like, I, I don't know how to describe it, like, the coming-of-age moment of, of realizing that suddenly you're not invincible, you know, as a child. Yeah, well, your innocence is gone all Completely. of a sudden. Completely. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the experience of this day. And just, I I feel like that's the best way to convey how horrifying it really was for everybody. They had hundreds of nearby law enforcement officials who were brought in to investigate and search the area after what happened. And many of these men and women who were in the field, they had never seen something like this ever. Like they had, I had, a lot of them had never even seen murder, let alone like such a gruesome and grisly murder of these girls. Forensic examiners uh, were brought in and they were able to conclude that it was more than likely that two of the girls, like I said, um, had their lives ended while in the tent, but were then carried off. But Doris Denise Milner, and we don't know why it was her who was 10, was made to walk for an unknown reason. Uh, When she was found, her hands had been bound behind her back using a small rope as well as masking tape, which was found on the body. And the investigation is massive. Um, They would end up with a suspect and interview list that surpassed more than 120 people with no leads for the majority of this case. Uh, And the news coverage around this is insane. Like, everybody is dying to know what happened, who did this, because they're still on the loose. They're out there somewhere. So then we get the first major break in the case, which comes from a nearby cave. But before I go any further... 
any thoughts and everything I just laid on you because I know it was I was very heavy. It was a lot. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, just to think that this would have to have been so premeditated to the degree like to to know that because I, I just don't think you go into a camp without mm-hmm. an idea of how you're going to execute this. And yeah. I mean, obviously any attack on children and sexual assault on children is just so incredibly disgusting. And it's a, it's a horrific evil. story. Yeah. It's, it's evil. And do like, you know anything whoever, about what comes next? Like, cause you're, you're kind of like, dead I on have the trail. no idea what comes next. Like I am literally on pins and needles to, to, to know who this person was that did this and why well, you're, you're pretty dead on with like, obviously saying that this was premeditated. It's, it, it's not very shocking, but there is evidence that comes to light of just how planned this was and that yeah. other people knew about it being planned. You're, you're going to lose your mind over this. Um, oh my God. So let's see. So there is a uh, break in this case that is made with a nearby cave that's just off the campground. So this ties back to a local hunter who had been near the campsite after this had all you know, gone down and he finds this cave and he reported what he found inside to police. It contained a number of items, but of the most critical of these items to the case, uh, it had a newspaper and it also had masking tape. Now, this is why these two items are important. So the flashlight that was found with the girls, um, or on top of one of the girls, as it was described, it had newspaper that was stuffed inside uh, up against the battery to prevent it from rattling while they were walking. It also had some kind of masking tape, which was used on the rope that had bound Denise Milner, but it had masking tape that was taped over the actual bulb of the light, and there was a pin prick that was made, so whoever had this flashlight was using it so they could travel kind of stealth, you know, like they could use not a lot of light but still get around, Mm -hmm. and nobody would hear it, barely anybody would see it, so... Those are key key pieces of evidence because the paper is actually matched to the exact paper that was found in that flashlight. So it's very clear that whoever did this to these girls had been in that cave. So it also had a pair of sunglasses, and this is where things get insane. So this would uncover another link to the case, which was not previously disclosed. One of the counselors prior to this incident had reported a theft to like their head counselor at the camp. And this was on the summer um, during, like, a training session before any of the Girl Scouts got there. They probably took, like, a week or so to just, I don't know, get their bearings, learn the camp, learn, like, what the itinerary and the activities were. So this counselor reported that in her tent, someone had, like, ransacked her stuff and stole her sunglasses, but had also eaten her food and left a handwritten note. I'm going to get you the exact quote of what it said. This handwritten note that's left says, we are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one. (gasps) This was at the beginning of the summer before any of the girls had come for the Girl Scouts. So she reported this at the time to the head counselor. And this was, I think, brought back to the Girl Scouts. But after review, it was concluded that this was most likely some kind of a prank and they didn't take it seriously. So it was just kind of left out you know no one ever reported back about it and even after this happened to the girls the girl scouts were very hush about it until the sunglasses were recovered and this counselor comes forward she goes those are my sunglasses like my stomach is in knots right now it's unbelievable like the things that they knew and the things that they concealed um just as a way to save face cover their ass whatever they were doing but to know that like this was not only premeditated but it was warned it was warned. Yeah, like it could have been prevented. Abso- absolutely. So, like I said, shockingly, this is chalked up to a prank. Um, and the Girl Scout overnight uh, trips would commence regardless. So, the heightened criticism comes back to the Girl Scouts for concealing this and having not disclosed it to any of the parents prior to June 12th. But there is definitive evidence, if I could take you back to the cave, that is also found. There are two pictures um, that are located in that cave. And the pictures are less important because they're just kind of pictures of like girls, women. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but it's important that the pictures are traced back to where they were developed. So these are traced back to a development um, site that was located in the Granite Reformatory Prison and belonged. these pictures belong to Jean Leroy Hart. We've got a suspect. Mm. So who was Jean? So Jean is a Locust Grove native. He had been in that town for pretty much his whole life, but he had formerly been imprisoned under some really violent and horrific uh, sexual assault charges where he... Just four years prior, I think um, in the summer of four four years prior to what happens, not at the Girl Scout camp, but when he escapes, he is incarcerated in 1966 because he abducted two pregnant women outside of a nightclub and had like viciously assaulted these women. Um, Mm. I don't remember reading in the report if they actually got away, but... They, they must have. I don't think they were murdered because, believe it or not, despite abducting them and raping them, he is put on parole. He is not even sentenced to prison in 1966. He <sighs> gets sent to prison because following being on parole, he breaks parole and then is caught on a burglary charge. So that's what puts him in prison in 66. But he escapes twice. Insane. Like, it's insane. Insane. So he gets out the first time, I think the first time when he's detained, but then he's brought back and then eventually escapes the second time. And this is where we eventually get like confirmation from testimony of who he escaped with. Cause I think he left with two other uh, inmates and they confirmed that that was like a trick that he used to do that he would like get a flashlight somehow and he would put masking tape or some kind of like cover over the bulb and he would put a pinprick in it. So you could travel in the dark without being caught. So of course, this matches up to, to him as the lead suspect. Mm-hmm. So he had escaped from prison in Locust Grove. And this was like, yeah, he had, been on, he had been on the run for years at this point. So he had never been caught. Parents were never notified that that had happened years and years ago. They were never notified about the strange warning signs or, or the theft that had gone on at the park, any of those activities. So it's believed that he was hiding out on that campsite and in that cave for a considerable amount of time. And he had planned after observing the Girl Scout, you know, trips coming in seasonally that he was going to take these girls. So now that we've got a suspect, the hunt ensues for this man. Uh, He's out there somewhere hiding, but the FBI is closing in on him because at this point, this is a national case. So somehow I, I not, quite sure how they're able to pinpoint exactly where he is. Um, I think through several friends that were kind of either feeding him or they were like letting him stay in the basement. They were letting him like, they were helping him in some way kind of stay in hiding, but someone confesses like someone comes clean or talks behind someone's back. So they're able to close in by April of 1978. And then this is where the story shifts to something that's even stranger. And it's really menacing. So we've now got him. We've got Gene Leroy Hart. Um, His trial would take place in 1979, and the proceedings are horrific for these families. So at this point in the trial, um, they're getting to the point where they have to show photos of the crime scene to the jury to explain what had actually happened. And families were asked to leave the room as it was so bad and insufferable. But they refused. The majority of those families stayed because they, they've said later in statements from what I've researched that they, as much as they understood about the girls, you know, that they gave life to, they needed to understand their death to -hmm. really have a certain amount of closure, which I don't think, you know, anyone or a normal person could really understand. I, I think that that was, it was maybe something that they needed at the time to make it feel real in some odd way, because it's, it's beyond comprehension. A lot of this. So the pictures are shown, the trial proceeds, and by March 30th, 1979, in what would be one of the most shocking upsets of a national murder case, and despite all of the circumstantial evidence to support that he is responsible, he is acquitted on all three counts of the murders. It's, it's like, it's, so the jury had ruled that they just did not believe there was enough concrete evidence to support that he was in that camp on that night and had done that to those girls, you know, cause they have a, 
they have a footprint, they have a fingerprint, a smudged fingerprint that they can't match, but they certainly have evidence that he was most likely in a cave that was a, a bit of a ways away from the campsite. But the jury felt they could not definitively rule and sentence him based on the idea that he was in the camp that night. Despite this very violent, you know, history of sexual assault and abduction. I'm like thinking about like matches handwriting to that note or something. Nothing. I mean, I think even that matched actually, but like it was still ruled as inconclusive for some reason. I don't know. I mean, they just, the jury felt there wasn't enough evidence, even though everybody knows it was this man. Mm -hmm. So of course it's, it's a, it's a national upset. It's infuriating. Um, and the ramifications of this verdict are devastating for the families, but also, um, because of like the huge coverage around this at the time, I mean, I think this is what really spiraled the story into something new because it was a horrific headline at first, but it's kind of like the Casey Anthony effect where the headline is terrible and everybody is waiting, you know, for, for the sentence, the assumed sentencing. But when it doesn't come, it like solidifies this horrible mark on an already horrible story that justice was never served to somebody. It's awful. So, Despite being found not guilty, he is returned to prison uh, because, remember, he had escaped from prison. So at this point, he was caught and he still had a former sentence to finish. In another shocking upset, just two months after he was found not guilty, but he's back in prison, he dies in prison of a heart attack. Mm. So with his death, I think a lot of the closure that these families needed kind of went with him because they knew that he would, he would never see the kind of justice that he, he was probably deserving of, but he didn't get to serve a considerable amount of time. I think that's what I was trying to say is that he, mm -hmm. he didn't serve any of the punishment that he was deserving of. How do you feel about that? Well, are you, are you just as shocked as I am? Cause it's, I am. So I can't shocked understand it. <laughs> Because, you know, we hear in murder cases a lot of times, like, the jury doing something like this, the person gets acquitted. Like, I'm thinking, like, OJ. Like, it mm -hmm. was so yeah. obvious, and yet he was acquitted. But I think a lot of that had to do with the fame, the notoriety, mm -hmm. the fact that it was a woman, his wife. Like, these are, like children nine times out of ten a jury is going to ride on emotion right on I emotion mean, in, in this it case it's the, it's the truth it is the absolute truth yeah. i mean there's really no way around that in my mind that it yeah. was clearly him um so i am shocked like i absolutely especially back then like in the 70s i am yeah i mean i'm very curious to like actually dig into the defense around this because i'm interested to hear about like what kind of jury was selected because we know shady yeah. goes on with like old juries, old court systems. Like I just don't know what the incentive is to protect a man like this. I think it more so has to do with probably the defense attorney and trying to like get another notch in the belt sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Another, like you said, another feather for the cap, <laughs> different context, oh. but <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, if we're talking about closure for these families, of course they wouldn't see closure from him being sentenced however this was before the era of dna evidence mm -hmm. so by 1989 we now have dna evidence and a dna test was conducted that confirmed three of the five samples from evidence that was collected at the scene matched samples of Hart's dna so then this would later see a further investigation by 2008 um, where another sample from one of the girl's pillowcases, which I think I read was a seminal stain. Um, this was conducted, but the stain had eroded to the point where the test was inconclusive. So then money is raised again. Because at this point, I mean, the state is not funneling anything more into this. Um, yeah. So it's completely public funded. Um, I think it was actually a sheriff uh, from Oklahoma who, like, did the fundraising for this. Like, really rallied people to raise, I think, $30,000 so they could do another test. And by 2018, um, they finish up that round of fundraising and they conduct a final DNA test of the evidence. And by 2022, the results were publicly released with the permission of the families who are still living, uh, which almost definitively ruled that without a doubt, Hart was involved in what happened in those woods. 
and these families would finally see some form of closure as to what happened to their daughters out there, even though they knew. Everybody knew. Yeah. But because the evidence didn't see any further hearings or, like, trials, and this was kind of, like, a privately funded thing that was then publicly released, um, even though it suggests that Hart is, of course, likely involved, it is still listed as an unsolved case on paper Hmm. to this day. And it would go down. I know. It's... It's, it's really thought of as one of the most horrific and widely covered murders in modern history. Um, and it has infam- infamously, people have clung to this name uh, of the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. And that is everything we know about that case. I think what makes me so mad is that the closure I would want as a parent, even if this is selfish, is I would want him to say that he did it. Yeah, yeah I did it. And they An admission never of guilt. That. Yeah, just something. Yeah. yeah, just something to know. Oh, my God. It's pretty remarkable how these parents have... have I've, I've read about the parents quite a bit as well. Um, I know Lori Farmer's mother is a... She is a huge advocate, and I think she, she even started an organization um, for parents who have had, had their children murdered. You know, like support mm-hmm. groups, you know, resources... Um, financial resources for them, but they've also, they have passed bills, they have done public speaking, um, but it doesn't really erase, I think, the immense grief that they feel. I specifically remember reading about Denise's mom and says that she has never been to her daughter's grave. She can't do it. And this is like 30 years later. I think that a, a child being murdered is the worst thing in the world that could ever happen to you. A child dying is yeah. awful. A child being murdered is, oh my gosh. Yeah, she, her God, mother that really said makes me so mad. It's it's so it's infuriating, and I think what makes me the most upset about it is that odd behavior like that wasn't reported. It was intentionally yes. concealed ahead of allowing children to go to this camp. I don't, I can't understand that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I mean that, and also just thinking about all of the opportunities they had to put this man back in jail. Like he escaped. He twice, <laughs> twice, twice, you know, like clearly the abduction of the two pregnant women, like it just, it, they had all that evidence too in the case. I'm sure like his record and still people mm-hmm. let him off. Like that was wild to me. I was watching the staircase and I almost wonder if it was a similar, cause I know this is a tactic for defense attorneys um, when like they know their case is kind of sunk and like the jury yeah. is probably running off of like very, very apparent circumstantial evidence and like high emotions. They give like a little um, closing argument to the jury basically where they, they like reaffirm what their job is And they say, your job is not to ride on your emotions. Your job is to be a neutral spectator to the evidence that exists. They literally did this in the staircase case. Um, Your job is to assess what we have available and decide whether or not that is enough to support that this person is without a doubt responsible. And it's a very manipulative tactic because like, Beyond riding on emotion, I mean, like, you can ride on somebody's past, of like, a violent past, a criminal history, or, like, the evidence that he was living in a f***ing cave outside of this camp. Like, what? Who else do you think did this? Like Exactly, exactly. See, that's my point, is that there was nobody else. There were no other... Who who else could it have been? Like, yeah, I mean, that's what's baffling to me. He's living in a cave. Like, that's not normal. You're just living in a cave outside of a campground for little girls. Not also, normal. I'm, I'm sorry, escaped. a cave that had evidence that was tied back to the literal crime scene? Newspaper and masking tape that was found? I didn't even mention this. The masking tape was found, that was found in the cave, had a yeah. rip, a rip on it that matched the exact, like, end of the rip of the tape that was found on Denise's what? arms. Like, <laughs> I guess, like, the argument they were saying, they're like, well, although those are his belongings, there's no evidence he was in that cave. I'm like, what the f*** are we doing? Like, what are we talking about? Like, I yeah. I could never be, I, I could never be, like, an attorney. I, I'm too much of a loose kid. 
No, I it doesn't it blow your mind? That was what I was starting to think about too when you were describing the, the trial. Can you imagine being that defense attorney and having to being being a defense attorney for a criminal defense attorney must be such a exercise for the brain like Mm -hmm. because we all have our guts and we all feel when something is off and you're just literally training yourself to not care yeah i mean there (laughs) are some that don't there there are some that throw cases completely i mean i've I've read about that i've seen defense attorneys who like they have no further you know arguments to make they don't call any Mm -hmm. witnesses that's happened in some pretty famous cases actually but yeah I, i don't really know i understand that it is he was definitely like a publicly appointed defense attorney, of course. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you could rewire your brain to do something like that and to try to convince people that like someone who was so clearly guilty was not. I mean, even to like, I don't know, get a, try to get a plea deal if you pled guilty mm-hmm. and maybe like had it like a, a lesser sentencing. Because I think if he was found guilty, they probably put him to death. Yeah, back I, I think I yeah. Oh, I think he was the death penalty around. Yeah, death penalty was definitely around in Oklahoma. Oh, for, for sure. sure. Death penalty, like only very recently, was not a thing anymore. I'm pretty sure. I, I think it's still around. I was reading about something in either South or North Carolina. Did we talk about this last time? Where they've run so. out of? I don't know if it's a supply chain issue or it had anything to do with like I don't know shipping ramifications from COVID. But they ran out of whatever they use for lethal injections. Oh, and wow. they reverted back to firing squad, death by firing squad. <sighs> Have you read wow. anything about this? This no. is in 2022. Whoa. I read that and I was like, holy shit. Like, death by firing squad? That's, I don't know why that's like very scary to think about. Of course, like people on death row, that's a whole different conversation. But, I don't know. I, I just had never in, in a million years imagined that like we could go back to something like that. It, it feels in my mind, it feels like going back to like, I don't it's know. Bar- like be- it feels barbaric. A little it feels bit. Like, like beheading it's... executions. And I'm not trying to be an yeah. apologist or anything, but like it just, that's no, how no, it no. struck me where I was like, holy shit, this feels like the chair. Like this feels like putting yeah. someone to the chair. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ugh. I guess not to be so morbid, but with death by firing squad, I guess they turn you around and then it happens. So I guess it's not like you're staring them down as it's about to occur, but yeah, it just feels very barbaric and it's, it's shocking. It's very shocking as hell. Yeah. Um, I wonder where that, where that did actually happen. Hold on. Death by firing squad. It was either North or South Carolina. Please say it's south. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, Stu. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's South Carolina. Yeah. So it looks like the only states that are still um, petitioning to practice this are Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Utah, as well as South Carolina. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm sorry to have put you through that. I know that was a very heavy case, but it was a request, and... It's really, it's shocking. It's a shocking case, and I wish it had a better outcome. I really want to watch that Kristen Chenoweth documentary now. Yeah, I would watch it Can you imagine, like, what that must feel like for her to know she was about to go there? Yeah, I'm I'm curious, like, if she was supposed to be, maybe this is a reach, but was she supposed to be the fourth girl in that tent? That's why they were down a girl? If that is true, um, like, I'm... (sighs) Some kind of divine oh intervention, gosh. like insane yeah. survivor's guilt. But yeah, I mean, their tent was the only tent that was down a girl. They All the tents slept four girls. I mean, I'd up, also actually. be curious to know, like the, I, and this is kind of why I want to watch the documentary, the layout of this campground, like how the tents were kind of arranged because... I do oh, think I'll it is it fascinating. Yeah, I feel like it's fascinating to think about um, the degree in which Jean or whoever, but Jean had to plan out this attack. And mm-hmm. also the fact that the girls, were they found with any sort of like 
tape over their mouths or anything? Or they just kept quiet the whole time? So I think what had actually happened, um, the way it was described in the report, two of the girls, I think, were pretty instantly killed within the tent. Okay. Um, they were bludgeoned. So I think that before they were killed in their sleep, I think, like bludgeoned okay. in their sleep. And then there was evidence that he assaulted them even after he killed them. Yeah. Um, but Denise, the oldest, 10 years old, was still alive. Um, so she had probably seen this happen. And I think to say like you would be in shock or that you would be, you know, paralyzed within your body is, is beyond, you know, a necessary statement. I, I don't even think she could comprehend what she was seeing, let alone take any sort of action, any sort really of survival. Dark, too. She might not have even like known what the heck was going on. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I guess it comes to the question of like, why didn't she scream unless he bludgeoned them went to her next and, you know, told her like, if you say anything, I'll kill you, you know, something yeah. to some sort of scare tactic to keep her quiet. But no, I don't think they were found with any sort of tape over their mouths. Um, mm. It was just Denise who was bound. She had her hands behind her back. So she really had no like physical defense once he took her out there. Do they have any theories about um, the like grunting noise that that counselor heard? Like, do they think it was him dragging the, no, I, it's shocking because I had never heard that in any of the research, not even in like the, the previous podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't until I watched, oh God, I'm forgetting of the name of it. It was some documentary that was really well done on this um, that mentioned that counselor having that like 1.30 a.m. experience. And mm -hmm. you know, she's still not sure whether or not it was him, although it's more than likely it was. Yeah. Um, it's just so... Ooh, it's so chilling to think. Think about like people like stumbling upon something and like being a hair away from death or tragedy like that. Like there's a really famous story of um, during like the ten but the ten uh, Bundy era in California in Hollywood, people like doing a night hike and like stumbling upon one of his bodies while he was there and like hitting the leg in the dark and being like, what was that? And like thinking they tripped over a rock or something and then continuing on. Like he told that story later after he was caught. I'm pretty sure it was Ted Bundy. It's gotta be Ted Bundy. But yeah, let me send that you a picture of, um, wild. I know I'm going to send you a picture of the actual camp. Let's see. Are you texting it to me? I'm going to text it to you. Okay, let me grab my phone. Do we have a chat feature in here? Maybe I could just chat it to you. I've never I done that. Do. So for anyone who can't see this, obviously, the way I can describe it again is that it's basically a ring of tents. This is labeling it as tent number seven, although, I, like I said, I've read in several reports that it was tent number eight. The counselor's tent is the furthest, I believe, from the victim's tent. So it kind of goes in like a, I don't know, like a half circle or like you could say a horseshoe. And the counselor's tent, the view is partially obstructed from the showers. And then there is like a campfire that's kind of like, a bit of a ways away, but kind of to the center of all the tents. And then the girls' tent, tent number seven or eight, is closest to the latrine. The showers are at the same place where they have, like, the kitchen and the storage. So says this map. Do you know what strikes me about this is that if you're in the counselor's tent, you're obstructed by the kitchen and the... Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Yeah, you're, you, that's yeah. literally as it was described. You can't see, like, the girls' yeah. tent. I'm surprised they didn't do, like night checks uh, but maybe that wasn't a thing like maybe I, I hear a lot of stories from like you know the 70s the 60s like people didn't even lock their doors like it was a different era of people feeling safe or like nothing would go wrong oh my gosh they dragged he dragged them a far way away yeah yeah it was I mean it was definitely off the main trail but shocking the whole thing is shocking and disturbing. Oh my gosh. The pictures of their tent also give me chills because I think I had envisioned when I first heard the story that it was kind of like a, um, it was like a tent that you would, you would set up versus like, this is, it is a tent, but it's more of like a cabin tent, I yeah. guess you could say. 
Did you see a picture of it? I'll send you one. No, send me one. That's what I was trying to think the whole time you were describing, too. I was thinking, okay, these are probably like those little tents that we had at camp where they were like more like little cabins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it had a proper like wooden door or anything. I think it was just like a curtain that was closed. Yeah. Ugh. It's just so foul to think about him walking in here. I know, I know. Plotting to do so. I wonder, I mean, if he had left that note at the beginning of um, the summer, I'm curious to to know, like, why he, why he chose to do it the way that he did, the night that he did. Like, why, that's really, like, the big miss of this outside of him never seeing justice is that no one ever really got to hold him accountable for, for the why. Like, there's no motive for any of it. And it's also bizarre that he didn't have, because as you were describing this, I was like, okay, this is going to be some weird, like, uh, pedophile. He's got a history of pedophilia. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy that he attacked children. Like, it's kind of bizarre. I mean. Well, because of his previous history, because those were adult women that he had attacked I know. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, a lot of times people that attack children are they're pedophiles like they purposely mm-hmm. are going after children so right. it's specifically he just he was like a violent sexual deviant who just wanted yes, to go yes. after anybody it seemed and he just went for the most vulnerable people it could be a pregnant woman it could be a child he's also so gross i just saw a photo of him yeah he's horrible absolutely horrible um but yeah, I I mean, researching the case, as difficult as it was, I'm happy that I, I got to do it on my own outside of listening to the podcast and, you know, getting to watch a few different, like, I would say versions of the story because I did see some conflicting information, but this is the crux of the story. And yeah, I think just doing a lot of the research on the backstory of the girls was the most helpful for me just to give like a, a little more context and to personify them a little bit beyond the pictures that I've seen. Yes, but even looking, I just looked at their pictures. I can match, I think, who, based off each of the characters I kind of created in my head from your description of those letters, like, it gives it even more color and yeah, makes it even deeper for me. Ugh. I know, looking at their pictures, it's a lot harder after the story as well. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, because I haven't seen in any of the maps where the actual cave was located, how far away it was. Because I wondered if that played at all into the evidence that was presented to the jury. I mean, maybe that was something they argued. They were like, well, the cave is like three miles away. So although it's technically like on this land, is it really in the camp? You know? It looks like a sort of a weird like cave cabin type of thing. You found a picture of the cave? I just saw a picture, yeah. Let me look it up and see what I can find. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really, really freaky. I don't like, and you, you can definitely see some of the evidence, too, that was found there. I think they have the pictures of the women that he had. Um, although, surprisingly, in some of the research, I really didn't see much of anything that talked about who those pictures were of, um, if they were related to this man, or if they were like, I, I don't know who those women are, those two, if it's the same woman. Mm-hmm. Not sure. But with that... <sighs> I guess we we can conclude the story because that is all that we know of the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. I am very grateful that you sat through this with me because I know that was a heavy case. Um, Thank Mm -hmm. you for listening to all of it. Um, But yeah, next time we'll do an unsolved case. We'll give ourselves a break. So it's not so (laughs) it's not so um, definitive and sad. Yeah. And we'll have to each watch the the documentary and see what else with Kristen Chenoweth. Yeah. 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 Imagine that she's not involved at all. She's like, yeah, I was like kind of going to go to that. I was also going to kind of going to go to the one that was in another state. I don't know. Like, oh my gosh. I wonder if like, she's how really much... involved. I don't know. Yeah. That, I've seen like clips where she looks like she's like in tears and walking through like, really very shaken. Yeah. So it would be, I mean, of course, anybody would probably feel that way. But yeah, um. I've, I remember 
an interview with her a long time ago where they asked her, you know, if you weren't like a performer, what would you be doing? And she was like, I would have gone into forensics. And they were like, oh, that's really odd. Why? And she was like, I've been fascinated with that. She didn't tell the story, but she's like, I've been fascinated by the psychology of the mind of a murderer for my entire life. And she's like, I probably would have gone into forensics so I could get a greater understanding of what compels someone to do something like that. And I never wow. tied it back to this case until I heard that she was involved. Cause that's a pretty new, like revelation. I would say in the media that Kristen, like no one's ever really talked about Kristen Chenoweth being linked to the Oklahoma girl scout murders. Right. Yeah. But with that, we can conclude. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. Thank you again for the suggestion. I know several creepers have suggested this, but again, I will give that shout out to Shri the B5. Thank you so much. <laughs> we Thank love you, you for Shri suggesting. Shri the B5. Shri the B5, your name makes up for how heavy this is. It's so light and cute. <laughs> it, it absolutely does. Yeah, I can't even believe you suggested it. I don't know what's going on at home, but I wish you the best. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> All right, guys, we will catch you on another one. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.